only mode. Afternoon, evening, morning. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, I'm joined today by uh, Tom Ewing, um, our well, basically, he won SMR's best paper last last year. Tom, I mean, you must Hello. still be glowing from from the you know from bribing the judges better than anyone else. <laughs> I'm still bankrupt from bribing the judges. The um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I I won fair and square the ESMR best paper. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for mentioning. That. <laughs> I'm 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 really just here as a kind of um, to sort of ringmaster and uh, and. And occasionally put in um, interjections from. I work in Bain Juicer Labs, and so I'll be kind of filling filling us in on the the, the very latest stuff. Yeah. So 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 the way we're going to run it is is I'm I'm going to kind of take take everyone through sort of turning human understanding into business advantage, a kind of whistle stop tour of behavioural economics and the sort of behavioural sciences. Uh, I hope you're going to enjoy it. Um, we we did one earlier, and I think some people's you know, kind of company firewalls mean that you struggle to see the uh, the charts, I think, for a few people. But I promise you, Tom and I will do our best to keep it interactive and a wonderful radio experience, even if you don't get the visuals, which we can send on, send on later. So, let's begin, because we're, we're basically going to try and make this uh, a little bit interactive. And do please kind of type questions, thoughts, heckles, and complaints and challenges are just as welcome as uh, as uh, intelligent questions because as you're about to find out we really we're getting a message you need to you need to share your screen oh I need to share my screen do I okay uh, I thought I was sharing my screen but uh, am I not is that is it now sharing so I'm waiting to view is it are, are, are we you see this was just so that everyone could experience the radio thing can you see the screen <laughs> John, can you share your screen? Still getting that press to play button. I have, I have, I have, I yes. have. I promise. I promise. <laughs> Sorry about this. Um, it's all right. It's all right. We're. Uh, it's all part of the. I've been made the presenter. No, don't show my screen. It's all right. All sorts of nonsense. All right. We're coming back. We're coming back. To, we're coming back to mine. This is great. This is this is radio live. What about now? Can you see? Homer Are we Simpson. supposed to be able to see slides? Are somebody? Yes. Can you now? Yes, I can. That's good. Yes, I think everyone can now. So keep typing if you can't. On screen should be the poster children, the poster boys of the uh, the new revolution. Daniel Kahneman in the top right hand corner um, of thinking fast and slow fame. He's also the only non-economist to win the Nobel Prize for economics. He's a psychologist. Um, and Homer Simpson, who you hopefully will see the relevance of uh, in a moment. Um, so, let's kind of start in a place where I think we're all extremely familiar, which is the current model. This is my sense of the current model of the whole of marketing and market research 101 which is that we've all grown up with a sense of left brain, right brain model of how human beings think and make decisions. And without really ever being told or questioning it, we've assumed that it's about 50-50 rational and emotional because the brain is split left and right. And uh, this, is, this is the part that I think is going to be challenged and challenged in a, in, a, in a good way by Kahneman and behavioral economics which has a slightly different model. So our current model, if I had to simplify it, and I, you know, I know it's always dangerous to simplify, but if we had to, you could, you could summarize it as current marketing, great marketing is a fist of a proposition, the USP, wrapped in a velvet glove of emotion. So we know that emotion, you know, we have to engage people and then we can hit them with our message and persuade them why our brand is better than the competitor's brand. All right, so far so good. What Kahneman um, and his partner have done is, is presented a different model of how the brain works and how people make decisions. And they call it system one and system two. Not left brain, right brain. So system one, because one is the original brain. It's the brain that human beings had, for, or the part of the brain that we had first. And it's the instinctive, intuitive, emotional brain. It's the fast thinking part of the brain in his book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. System two, which developed later, 
is the slow, deliberative, analytical, clever bit of the brain. And it is amazing. I mean, it separates us from other animals, and it is incredible. But here's the rub, and I think this is the this is the you know if, if if you if you get called away from the webinar in the next minute, at least take this thought, which is if you split system one and system two into computing power, system two, the clever, the thinky bit, would be 50 bits of power, and system one, the instinctive feeling bit, would be 11 million. <laughs> yeah, 50 bits. 11 million. The vast majority of decisions by the vast majority of people in the vast majority of circumstances are made totally instinctively, intuitively, and, and, and emotionally. And then, guess what we use the thinky bit for, the clever bit, to post-rationalize decisions that we've made in a totally system one way. So, to, to, if, if, I, if I could give you one thought to take away, bar anything else, and we're going to cover quite a bit of other stuff, it's this. We think much less than we think we think. And I'm afraid, and I'm as guilty as anybody about this, we, I think, have overthought We've certainly over-intellectualized the amount of thinking that consumers put into things. You know, we shop on autopilot, we make decisions on autopilot, and when I say autopilot, actually that's, that's an old-fashioned way of saying it almost. It's system one. That's, you know, to be more precise, this is what Kahneman and the behavioral scientists are trying to get us to realize, that we make decisions in this way. You know, the, the clever bit turns, turns out not to be the oval office of decision-making, it turns out to be the press office. Yeah, the majority of of uh, car adverts in 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 magazines are read after people have bought the car, not before. I wonder why that is. <laughs> Maybe it's to justify our totally emotional decision to purchase a particular car uh, with a few facts and figures for friends. Um, anyway, all right. So hopefully the Homer Simpson reference is clear. We're not thinking machines that feel, we're feeling machines that think. So on the screen you should see some dots. I'm not sure if you can tell what the dots represent, but as hopefully as soon as I click the next slide and it comes up for you, you'll see a walking man. It's instant, we get it, this is system one at work. This is pattern recognition. This is how the brain kind of works all the time. It's why we don't bump into other people on busy streets generally. And if we were doing this live, I'd, I'd currently be throwing bits of paper into the audience uh, and getting people to try and catch them, because catching is also a system one. It's totally instinctive and intuitive. We don't think about it. We don't calculate the angle of trajectory. And it's one of the things that we've, we struggle to teach robots to do. Robots are not good catchers because they have to do everything system two. They're very good at system two, but it's, it's a bit difficult. So talking of system two, just to illustrate that we don't generally use our uh, system two analytical thinking very much, this is an example Kahneman gave in his acceptance uh, speech, which was a bat and a ball cost a dollar ten together. The bat is a dollar more than the ball. How much is the ball? A bat and a ball are a dollar ten together. The bat is a dollar more than the ball. How much is the ball? The answer screaming in your head, I, I think, I, you know, it's, it's, uh, this has been done many, many, many times, is probably ten cents. And yet you know it's wrong. It's not ten cents. It's five. But what Kahneman says is the way that we make decisions or think about these things is we take a plausible answer that comes quickly to mind and we kind of run with that. It's kind of good enough. If you ever need to demonstrate, another nice example is if you took a piece of paper, just an ordinary piece of paper, and you folded it in half 50 times, it's physically impossible, but you know, if you could, how tall would the stack, you know, how tall would it be? And uh, I don't know if anyone knows the answer, but I don't know if you can guess, is it a meter, is it 100 meters, is it 1,000 meters? Usually, you know, someone says, the moon, you know, in a half-joking way. To which, of course, the answer is yes, to the moon, and back again, and back again. That's how bad we are at this, uh, at this stuff. Exponential numbers, we don't really do very well. Okay, now, let's bring it back into marketing and market research. On the screen should be a very recognizable logo, a brand, but 
with the actual brand name removed. So what I wanted to illustrate, just you know, before we get into uh, the other detail, is this is how marketing works. It works at a system one level. It's about recognition, not recall. Recall is a system two exercise. System one is all about recognition. It's just pattern recognition. And if, as I go through these, let's see if, if you can recognize each of these, where the, lo the actual name is removed, but you know, this logo, yep, it's Coke. What about this one? Um, Tom and I are in the UK, so it's six o'clock. We might be wondering whether we have one of these, but Heineken and Ferrari talking of cars and China's uh, leading fast food uh, chain, KFC. A mini mission. What we're going to do is throw a few research grenades as we go through uh, the uh, the webinar. The first of which is a mini mission to ban recall as a question. Okay, it's a short-term memory test. Nothing more. Nothing less. Nothing to do with whether people recognise a brand and whether it brings a wealth of emotion and association with it in a meaningful way. All right. So the summary of the whole thing: System one, the fast feeling, intuitive, instinctive, metaphoric brain, 11 million bits. System two, the clever, thinking, slow, analytical, propositional, conscious brain, 50 bits. Okay, let's not forget it. And what I want to introduce to you is, is a model. This is our sort of brain juicer attempt at wrestling what is actually an increasingly large body of, of thinking and work into, some, into a model which hopefully is simple but not too simplistic and memorable and, and applicable. You know, you can actually do something with it. Because I don't know if any of you, if you've been reading any of the literature, predictably irrational or um, nudge, whether you've had the same experience I did, which is you're reading a particular experiment or anecdote and you're thinking, this is brilliant. I, this is brilliant. We've got to find a way of applying this. And already I've forgotten the one that was 10 pages before. And you, you, before you know it, you've lost yourself in a forest of anecdotes and experiments. So, so this is our attempt to try and make it more sort of memorable and easy to deal with. And we're going to start with the world of environmental. So this is the ESP model, which I guess is appropriate for trying to explain brains and how we, how we make decisions. But let's start with environmental. And this is the world of nudge, if you want the kind of literature. And it's how things are framed, how things are presented, anchors, primes, and bas basically context. No decision is made out of context. And yet, how much of quantitative market research is made out of context or done out of context? Most of it. Anyway, we will come to that anon. Rolls-Royce, just a quick example to start with. Rolls-Royce apparently sell very few cars now from car showrooms. They sell the majority of rollers at boat shows. Because when you're looking at $10 million worth of uh, yacht or boat, half a million on a car seems a snip and a bargain. I'll take two. That is what we're talking about with environment. Everything is relative. Everything is about context. And you know, we've all experienced this. When you think of um, menus in restaurants, the wine list, you know, there's always one or two crazy expensive wines that only oligarchs can kind of uh, you know, buy. But what it does is it makes the already expensive wine in the middle seem reasonable. And that is an, a good example of what I'm talking about. Here, here's another. This was an experiment that was done in an off-license in a wine shop where they played French music for one week, yeah, just in the background. And during that week, sales of French wine went up five times. And on exit, when people were asked anything about the store, nobody had noticed the music. It wasn't that loud, but it had that influence. The week after, they played German music. And sales of German wine went up by two. They doubled, which is, I mean, again, and no one noticed the music. So the fact that it could have that much influence is amazing. Second, this is how stuff works. At a system one level, we associate France with wine quite a bit more than we associate Germany with wine. And actually, if it was beer, it would probably be the other way around. But that's what I mean by this sort of framing and environmental, the nudges can have a, have a massive effect. And there are, there are some 
there are some very interesting examples. One of the ones I heard recently was for, for um, uh, Davidoff cigarettes in, an off, in, in duty free. And one of the most successful things they did was not a promotion, not money off, not you know, giving people gifts. It was putting a piece of carpet in front of the fixture, which at a kind of you know, very unconscious level mimicked the business class, first class. I don't know if you, remember, you, know, if you noticed there's a bit of carpet there you know, when people queue up down a different aisle. And so somehow it made it seem more upmarket, and you know, and they had a significant up, uplift in sales. Anyway, just an example. The, the the next example I want to give you is is a pricing one, and I and I love the pricing examples because somehow, I suspect if we can prove that it works for something that everyone thinks of as as rational as pricing, you know, Homo economicus, we should be, you know, maximizing our returns, and we should be thinking about whether this is worth this would be a good example. So what the economist did, here's how the story goes. They had two offers. You could get all of the online, all of the content online only for $59, or you could get the online content plus the paper copy delivered for $125. And most people, almost 70%, chose the cheaper option. You know, it's the same content, what the hell. And then, Something strange happens, apparently by accident, so the story goes, an intern, you know, it's always the interns that get the blame, put up a really odd option, I mean a nonsensical third option in the middle, which was you could have the print copy delivered for $125. So now we've got online only 59, paper only 125, online plus paper 125. And now suddenly that third option seems a bargain and 84% of people choose that option. Just think what a transformatory effect that is if that's your business. This isn't a small promotional effect or, or even a um, you know, really good advertising effect. This is transformational. Most people are now paying you $125, not $59. Okay. So, to bring it back into market research, one last example, which is you know real in market research and, and starts to hopefully give you the implications of system one versus system two thinking. We had a client who came to us, they were a brand leader, and basically they uh, had a feeling that the packaging testing, every time they did packaging testing, it confirmed that their pack was the preferred pack by consumers. And yet, in the marketplace, the competitor was eating their lunch and getting basically stronger and stronger and closer and closer. And all we did is we asked the same questions, but instead of uh, just allowing people to scratch their chins and take as long as they wanted over questions, we made them answer the questions within 10 seconds each question. So more like shopping. So in other words, we forced them to make really quick, intuitive system one type um, decisions. And guess what? It suddenly revealed that the competitor's pack was the preferred pack. It was the more instinctive, more intuitive, easier to grasp, simpler, and it was the better pack. So it changed all of the quantitative pack testing results they'd ever done. That's how much difference thinking about the world through system one eyes can have. Okay. So Tom, tell us, tell us what else you're up to in labs uh, on the environmental front. Well, <clears throat> in the environmental front, I think the most exciting thing we're doing is, uh, is something called Brain Juice of Behavioral Lab, where we're basically getting, getting our kind of uh, experimental hat on, no coat on, is probably more to, the, uh, more to the point, but we're getting out on the road and kind of going around real environments where people are making real decisions about what to buy, and we're doing what's called behavioral audits. So we'll like go to kind of a dozen different bars or maybe a dozen different kind of retail outlets and look and look out for all the kind of things that might be having a sort of psychological or environmental or framing or triggering effect. And when we do that, we kind of come back and we kind of create a report. And then the exciting bit is that we're designing real interventions, things like the, um, you know, the equivalent of the, the, the mat um, sort of in front of the 
the kiosk that kind of helps raise sales. And it might be kind of, you know, priming with scent or kind of giving people chocolates to make them feel good or all different kind of things. Some of them work and help with sales. Some of them don't. Some of them have kind of ambiguous effects or do one thing good but maybe have another effect somewhere else. And we kind of record all this. And it's particularly exciting because it's making, it's taking research into the real world and, and using genuine in-store sales data as the, uh, as the, the, the measure of success. Um, so that's a particularly exciting part of what we're doing, and I think that's kind of the environmental end. So that's sort of A-B testing, but, you know, in real, real environment. Yeah. And, and obviously any online kind of companies it's easier to do just because the numbers are bigger, but, yeah. John, we should probably mention questions. Questions, I'm going to keep mentioning it at each stage. Anything that triggers your mind, write the questions down. We're going to try and kind of do them, at, do justice at the end. If you've got a, if you've got a heckle or a challenge, that's just as welcome. They're, they're, they're even more fun. So uh, don't, don't be shy. All right. So next up, we have the second area. So we've done environmental and now social. And this is the, the world of Herd, Mark Earls' book, The Herd, um, and his second book, I'll Have What She's Having, with some academics. And really, the summary of this area is that we, as human beings, are social animals, and we should be called homo mimicus, the copying one, not homo sapien, the thinking one. Hopefully, we've already established, you know, and we are really, really good at copying. In fact, we copy partly because, um, what's the phrase uh, Kahneman talks about, which I love? Yeah, cognitive, we are cognitive misers, <laughs> which I love. So anything that's a shortcut, anything that saves us having to use system two, we love. And basically copying is exactly, that's what it is. That's why we're so good at it. And that's why generally it's not a bad strategy. I mean, obviously it's an evolved strategy. If everyone was running away, you didn't stop and ask why, you just ran. Um, and there's a, there's a famous experiment that's done sort of first year psychology, if anyone's listening in, you know, you probably did this, um, where you get one person to stand on a street corner, a really busy sort of street corner, and pointing up at the sky as if there's some aliens, you know, a landing. And of course, everyone just gives them a wide berth, you know, they're a nutter. You get two people, the same. Three people, still the same. It's not until you get about seven or eight people, so a group, a kind of visibly um, identifiable group, all pointing up you know, as if there's something going on up in the sky, and you can make everyone in in um, eye line, for, you know, of that crowd, of that group, look up and go, what, what, what? We copy, you know, some if everyone's doing something, we copy, and if you need if we need proof that we copy blindly, then Crocs are surely it. Now. This is an experiment that was done about sort of social animals and, and the whole power of other people. And it was an honesty box where people had to put money in, where they were taking milk, and the only thing that changed was the picture, the poster, behind the box each week. One week it was flowers, next eyes, flowers, eyes, etc. And you can see, hopefully very quickly, that in the weeks where there were eyes, people were a lot more honest. The other experiment which I liked, um, was about pretzel selling. So there were three scenarios, and it was quite telling. So scenario A was somebody walking through a train selling pretzels, and on average, one person in each carriage bought pretzels. Scenario two is you had somebody in front of the person selling pretzels eating pretzels, you know, as if they bought a pack and they're kind of walking back to their seat. Three people in each carriage buy pretzels. Scenario three, you place one or two people eating pretzels on the train. I mean, this is obviously a busy, you know, busy train. In that third scenario, seven people per carriage buy pretzels. This is what happens. This is the effect of copying. And if you think of it in marketing terms, Amazon are brilliant at this, probably the best, I think, at this, where people who bought this also bought that. Here's the top 10 this. Here's the list of 100. Here's the kind of recommendations based on what other people are doing. They're really good. And boy, does it work. Because these are shortcuts. They're cognitive shortcuts, and we like them, and we tend to go with them. I mean, it is the reason for the 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 long t the whole long tail book. It's the you know the 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 hits and the stars in any industry are the ones that get rewarded because it's just easier than actually contemplating you know the the long tail, frankly. 
So you think about Apple um, and their white earbuds, you know, which for a while was just the most genius, that was the genius piece of marketing because people could copy. And then of course it does reach a zenith where everyone's wearing or doing something and then something else starts. And so, you know, in headphones, now everyone has, you know, people started to wear huge headphones. And then now everyone's wearing huge headphones. I suspect we're close close to the zenith of that, and no doubt there'll be a you know kind of something else to follow. Now, to bring it into market research, the reason that the whole social animal thing is relevant is central to market research, quantitative research, is you must ask me about me. Yeah, it assumes that we need scientifically sampled target audiences who are asked questions about themselves, never anyone else. The problem is that we are unreliable witnesses to our own motivations and future behavior. We are not good at predicting what we will do. And there are lots and lots of lovely experiments sort of showing this, but to mention a couple of studies, so 50% of Swedish men in one study believed that they were in the top 10% of best drivers. Now this is not just a Swedish thing, I'm afraid it's a male thing, I suspect. Um, and in another study, 90% of French men believe that they're in the top 10% of lovers. And of course, these are innocent and fun and, you know, no harm done in the delusions. But it's, it's no one wants to be below average in anything. And there are certain, you know, cultural kind of characteristics or whatever it may be. And so me research, which is basically the central tenant of quantitative market research, what, what would happen if we turned it on its head and we said, do you know, as social animals, we are better at predicting what other people will do than we are at predicting what we will do. And let's see what that looks like, yeah? So the example that, you know, all of our thinking came from was in James Sorowiecki's Wisdom of Crowds, and it was the IEM, the Iowa Electronic Market where I think now they've done something like 700 elections. And in these 700 elections, they've had a group of, of unrepresentative group of 500 white, or mainly white middle-aged guys in Iowa, buying and selling shares in who's going to win the election. And this totally unrepresentative group, basically their gut feel of how other people are going to vote has been more accurate than the most accurate poll in each one of those elections three quarters of the time. Now considering that polling is exactly is where quantitative market research came from, this is quite significant. And if anyone's in any doubt, I don't know which countries everyone's listening, but there's an election about to happen in Italy. And I was there last week and this came up as a, as a, as a topic because dear old Berlusconi is running again. And of course, it, it, it's such a lovely example for anyone who, who kind of knows anything really about Berlusconi and Italian politics. If you ask people in a classic poll, would you vote for Berlusconi? Will you be voting for Berlusconi? You know, I suspect the answer is going to be quite low. If, on the other hand, you said, do you think your neighbors and other people are going to vote for Berlusconi? The answer is going to be significantly higher and I suspect more accurate. And this is, this is the, the evidence that we have. So. What we do in concept testing, so rather than trying to get the target audience to predict, because it purchase intention, frankly, is not very predictive of what happens, you take 15 concepts and you take a crowd of 500 people, so not the target audience, and you basically get them to split the ideas into, into those that they would probably buy shares in, or more shares in, and those that they would probably sell shares in, and then which of those would they double because that's going to be the biggest hit in the market and which one would they sell all because that's going to, you know, you'd lose all your money. And it gives you basically a very normal, stable percentage of 500 people who would probably buy shares, very, you know, very clear what's worth pursuing. And then you get this people doubling minus people selling and a net preference, which hopefully in this chart shows you how much greater distinction, you know, discrimination that you can get. So this was um, seven bubblegum ideas. So this is kids' research, and it's kids, and they, you know, it's bubblegum. What's not to like? Everything was high. Everything was wonderful. 
It's not until you get into the predictive market, and by the way, we did this predictive market with adults, adults and kids, you know, and different audiences came out the same. There's one idea that's clearly better than the others. Say no to deeply average. And if you're worried whether this translates into, you know, success in markets, there we have, we, we've now tested something like 19,000 concepts this way around the world. And increasingly have a big database of those that have gone on to be massively successful. So in our scheme, it's one to five star. If it's a four star idea, it's pretty damn good. And sure enough, it goes on to be you know, hugely successful. So, so Tom, give us, a, give us a quick sense of uh, the lab's work. Your social stuff that John's been talking about is very much quant. <clears throat> it's predictive markets, which is a terrific quantitative way of tapping in to uh, the power of, of we, of social. Um, but obviously there's another side to research which is qual and we have a, a fantastic qualitative team in the form of our juice generation team at Brain Juicer and our labs team work with them as well and one of the things we've been working on is kind of uh, how to get that we, um, that we research, how to take qualitative research which is often about depth, it's about looking deeply into the individual and kind of getting to their deep motivations and how to make it about breadth as well taking it out and creating that kind of we research, making it more observant of others. And there's a couple of ways we've been doing this. We've been doing kind of mass ethnography, mobile ethnography with, with phones, with people kind of recording one another and observing. Um, but we've also been adjusting our kind of qualitative communities to make them more we um, and uh, uh, make them more social. And one experiment there, which is quite nice, is we, <clears throat> we ran a community about laundry and we split it up into two groups. And we asked one of them a kind of trad question. Um, which was, you know, tell us about your laundry routine, kind of go into it. Then we asked the other of them what we called the rad question, which was, uh, tell us about what you don't do in your laundry routine, but that you know other people do. So we asked the, the, the first question, the kind of me research question, and it, it, 30 people, 100 replies, kind of a bit of back and forth, not bad as far as community threads go. The second group, 30 people, 400 replies, four times as many replies about what do other people do? And the fascinating thing was that, of course, because they were revealing uh, what they knew other people did and that um, what they kind of, you know, what they wouldn't do with their laundry, they also revealed who they were paying attention to. So we got a read on who influenced them as well and the way in which kind of influence and ideas were passed down um, and things. And that's a kind of question that's very hard to ask directly. It's hard to talk about influence in kind of qualitative terms, but it gives a really important read on it. So I think that kind of some of the experiments we're doing in qual, in making our communities and our, our qualitative work more social, is the really exciting frontier for us here. Great. Thanks, Tom. So the third area. So we've done environmental, the world of kind of framing and context, social, copying, and the world of other people, and now personal is probably the more familiar area, you know, that we've all, because it's, it's more psychology and how, how do we, you know, internalize things, but, and this is the world of predictably irrational, uh, Dan Ariely's books are fantastic on this, and his latest one, uh, The Honest Truth About Dishonesty, is, uh, is, a, is quite an amusing read, actually, but what we're talking about here is really hot states, or more to the point, how people feel has the biggest impact on what we do, much bigger than I think we have acknowledged. And this is just to start with a slightly odd experiment, uh, if ever they were, um, about visceral states, hot states, and the, you know, those would include hunger, arousal, thirst. This one was about arousal. And what they did is, <laughs> rather strangely, I, I admit, is they asked a group of male undergraduates some weird questions. Are women's shoes erotic? Yes, 42% said they are. Can you imagine having sex with a 50-year-old woman? 28%. Would you keep trying to have sex after your date says no? 20. And is a kiss just frustrating? 41. <laughs> now, the, uh, those of you that are still looking at the charts uh, rather than just listening in uh, will see a very worrying um, header of the second column, which is aroused. So they then got a second group to arouse themselves, sexually arouse themselves, and they asked them the same questions, and lo and behold, 42 becomes 65, you know, now think women's shoes are erotic, 28 to 55, 20 to 45, 41 to 69, it makes the most enormous difference to how people answer the question, how people feel 
is massively important. And, and if I had to put in, in an order the number one challenge for the market research industry, it's how to measure emotion, how to measure system one in its broadest sense, which includes intuition, instinct, and emotion. And there really isn't that much around. And I, you know, I think, and we applaud and you know, would congratulate anyone trying to do this, you know, because I think this is the way we need to go. Anyway, what we did is we took a guy called Paul Ekman, whose life's work was going around the world with suitcases of photographs of different cultures and nationalities and basically showing them to you know, tribes in Papua New Guinea or you know, Caucas pictures of Caucasians to tribes in Papua New Guinea and vice versa. And he came up with this idea that there are seven emotions that are universally recognized in people's faces. It's an evolved ability that we've learned over time because if, and, and the reason that five of them are clearly negative, because it's very odd scale in marketing terms, there's only one clearly positive, which is happiness. Now, there are different types of happiness, everything from ecstasy, which is probably quite close, you know, a religious experience, which is almost apple, right the way through to uh, schadenfreude, you know, the joy of others' misfortune and pride, etc. They're about 12, but they're not recognizable as a distinct look in people's faces, but happiness is. Then there's surprise, which can be positive or negative, and then five clearly negative ones, sadness, anger, contempt, disgust, and fear. Um, and we took this and, you know, put a poor model through hell, recreating the emotions and getting kind of a, a very simple way to say, how do you, you know, which of these faces best expresses how you feel about this ad, this product, this politician, this whatever. And we added neutral because, you know, the single most important score and the worst score, by the way, is not negative, it's neutral. Because if you feel nothing, you do nothing. And it might well be, I mean, you know, left to, instinctively we might think happiness, surprise is good, neutral is just as it sounds in the middle, and then negative emotions would be negative for your marketing. No. Happiness and surprise, then less powerful but still commercially valuable to you, negative emotions. Let's take, I don't know, just for instance, Ryanair, whose tagline should be the world's worst airline and proud of it. It's not doing too badly. And those adverts that you love to hate, you know, actually any emotion is more commercially valuable to you than no emotion. And too much of what we end up, you know, kind of approving and doing is neutral. It's perfectly bland and acceptable, but it's neutral. So say no to neutral. Now, what we do is we translate it into those emotional scores into what star of marketing is it? Is it one star straight to video? You're going to spend more money making and airing this than you'll ever get in return. You need a three star performance to get a positive ROI and five star performance is the stuff of famous marketing, famous branding. The um, I, I have to acknowledge and thank the methods man at P&G for giving me the following um, construct, which is on the left-hand side of the chart here. He said, okay, we're presenting all of the evidence that advertising, famous advertising that creates the biggest commercial effects is totally system one and emotional. And he was like, okay, that is fascinating. So our model, P&G model, is, if you like, 115 to 120 return for every 100 we put in. That's our model. That's the maximum we get. It's harder and harder to get it, and, you know, uh, but you know, that's our model, and it's a system one and two, you know, product demos and everything else. What you're telling me is that we're missing, we're actually constraining our ability to take the lid off that and get returns on investment of 160, 180, 200 by being totally emotional. Yes. So, you won't be able to see the video, so I'm going to just sort of fast forward with the Cadbury Gorilla example, which I know a lot of people have seen and talked about, but it's a good one because it's so extreme as an advert. And what you're seeing on the right-hand side is how people felt about it as the minute's worth of advert progressed. So you've got surprise and happiness at the bottom, 
neutral is the white, and then you've got the negative emotions. And you can see that when you're watching it, I don't know if you remember watching it you know, the first time, you're kind of thinking, what the hell is going on? And actually, there's, a little, there's, there's quite a bit of negativity building at the top. And then it's resolved, and you, know, you pull back and you see it's a guy in a gorilla suit playing drums. But the reason I sort of share this, and, and there are other adverts, recent adverts, that would conform you know, to this, like the VW Darth Vader, that brilliant uh, ad advert, which was the hit of last year's uh, sort of Super Bowl. Um, the classic model of how advertising works is basically system one and two together. It, it engage, it's, a, it's, a, it's a golden triangle of engagement, because you have to engage in order to get someone's attention, message, because surely the whole point of advertising is you have to then convey a message, something, you know, some information about the brand, and brand recall. You have to be able to tell us what brand the message and the engagement was for. Engagement, message, brand recall. Well, I'm sorry, but that is not how the most successful advertising, by successful I mean commercial return works. On the right hand side, is the Cadbury Gorilla classic measures, persuasion, relevance, etc. And it's massively below norm. And yet this advert was hugely successful. On the left hand side it is the emotional resonance. I'm afraid system one emotion is what matters. And you don't need to see it again and again and again for it to actually work. So if we put it on a five star rating, you can see Cadbury Gorilla VW, Darth Vader, and P&G. Now there's a surprise. The Olympics Thank You Moms ad, which is a great ad. It's a five-star ad. And when I presented it there last, last year, I mean, you know, it's their own ad, but they were obviously very proud of it, and rightly so. But I said, do you know why you were able to make this advert? And there was a bit of, well, you know, slight, you know, silence, shuffling of feet. And I said, because there's no product. So you were liberated from your own model of how advertising is supposed to work. And my prediction is that that advert will have more commercial impact on products you're in your range which people associate with Procter & Gamble than the product-specific advert. And anyway, we will, we will see um, whether we can get any of the evidence or whether it's ever revealed. But uh, interesting, you know, it's, it's, it's good, it's interesting challenge really. Just to kind of summarize, we did some, we've done a huge amount of experiments with the IPA effectiveness database, uh, where we've taken famous five-star advertising, three-star, one-star, um, and when you plot all of them across any category, by the way, it doesn't make a difference what category it is, the only measure which is basically a positive correlation with efficiency is emotion. Persuasion, cut-through, brand linkage, key message, costs a lot of money and is less effective. Basically, it's about three-star advertising. So you can get an ROI, but it's a small one. Emotional ads, how many times do you need to see the Darth Vader, M&Ms, Miss Brown, um, Cadbury Gorilla for it to have almost all the emotional resonance it's going to have once, maybe twice? Anyway, make my brand famous is, I think, what we should all be trying to do. And fame is driven by emotion. And whether that's at point of sale or in advertising, um, that's, that's what matters. Um, so go on then, Tom. Give us the stuff, stuff that you're exploring in the world of personal. Right, here's, here's, the, here's the lowdown on the experimental stuff we're doing with personal. Um, <clears throat> the thing about personal is there's a kind of unexplored frontier, we think, for personal, and that's online. Online research, research into what people do online, is very much kind of, uh, we've got the environmental stuff down pat, there's a lot of kind of user experience um, kind of thing. We know sort of how different bits of, of, of websites work, we know how to optimize, and we know all about social, we know how people kind of come together, obviously social media, the two is in the name. Um, and there's a missing component, which we think is kind of emotion. Things like emotion, visceral states, how happy does, does going online make you feel, it depends what you do. So one of the things that we're doing is we're working with a web monitoring company that will allow us to kind of really map uh, people's entire sort of journeys online and then interact with them at, at particular points and sort of say, well, 
how are you feeling about this? What what kind of emotion are you feeling? And, and ask them kind of questions about that and if they've bought something about spend and such like. And so we're learning things like um, you know, happy people, if they if, if people are on websites are happy, they, they spend more, which is obviously a nice thing to find. It's kind of intuitive, but it's it's good to have it confirmed. Um, and we're learning some very interesting things about kind of how, how emotion and dwell time relate and how the kind of there's a sort of fatal gap between between browsing and buying. Um, and browsing actually makes people quite miserable. It's not kind of fun to sort of explore and kind of wander around online. Um, you, you need to have some kind of culmination of that. So we're learning a lot from that and we're kind of building up new products that, um, that we'll be able to talk more about very soon, I think, uh, about those kind of uh, things. But that's kind of where it's at for us in labs on the personal side. All right. Well, look, our 45 minutes is up. Reminder, system one, 11 million bits versus system two, 50 bits. It's about feeling rather than thinking, and emotion rules the day. Now, those of you that can stay and want to heckle and throw challenges and questions at us, please do. But, you know, feel free. We're done. Uh, so, Tom, I know, I know you were well, looking yeah, at questions. We've, um, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, first up, there's a, there's a question which, um, which was actually asked in the previous um, webinar as well, okay. and we didn't have time to get to, so I'm, I'm really glad, um, which is about real time research it's um, you know the uh, the kind of uh, emotional uh, measurement that we're doing is still reflective um, are we going to be looking into uh, measuring research in real time and yeah and what does what does that look like well I, I mean certainly the whole wave of behavioral I mean literally behavioral data whether that's EPOS data from you know Dun Humby looking at um, you know retailers I mean obviously that's massive that's big data, it's happening in real time, you can, you know, analyze it. There's also the sort of thing that you were just talking about, um, uh, and I think the app was from Wakupa, where you can actually monitor what people are doing, you know, online at any, you know, yeah. at any time. And it's interesting, it is interesting, it is valuable. There's another one I saw where someone, people carry around a camera around their neck on a string, and it takes pictures, I think, every few seconds, every four seconds. And then you can kind of piece together somebody's day. It's more of a qualitative, you know, kind of ethno ethnographic. I think these things are really interesting. Where they become, they go from interesting to rev most revealing and fascinating is when you can add the emotional measure as well, where you can actually find out how people were feeling at that time, and ideally why, if you can. Now, that's a hard thing to do. but things like face trace that we use, you know, what we used in the online thing, it does work, it's good enough, and it, it gives you both bits of the jigsaw, if you like, um, and is uh, intriguing what it reveals. Can, can I add another thing there, John, actually, which is um, that if you, if you read Kahneman's book on System 1 and System 2, if you get to the end, in the final part of Kahneman's book, there's this kind of like, it's sort of like in a blockbuster movie, where there's suddenly a setup for a sequel, because he gets into this whole interesting sort of divide between the remembering self and the experiencing self and it turns out that that's another thing that there's these two completely different experiences what you experience in real time and what you remember and kind of the sort of emotional impressions it leaves you with can actually be completely different things and so we're doing kind of some research into that um, and into looking at how to apply that so that's kind of the next system one and system two from from the brain of Kahneman very nice and so the challenges? next question uh, I'm, I, I have, they're starting to kind of rush in now, but there's, a, there's, a, there's another <laughs> okay. one, there's another good one. Um, they're all good, but this is a particularly good one, and again, it's something that came up in the earlier thing as well, so it's quite a hot topic. For a new product introduction, new technology, do you need a System 2 copy to differentiate, or System 1 Emotion would work even if you've got a brand new product? I know you've got strong feelings on this, John, so... Yeah, no, I do, I do, I do. And, and, and actually what it... Re what it raises is this idea of plausibility. Remember the bat and the ball or a dollar ten, you know, we take a plausible answer. We think it's plausible that advertising would work as engagement message and brand recall. And we think it's even more plausible that if it's a whole new brand that no one knows anything about, we've got to tell people something about the actual product and its function and everything else. But I'm afraid the evidence is no different for new brands than it is existing brands. It's the stuff that moves us emotionally that we remember, that becomes famous. 
just one cornetto, if uh, I'm, I'm about to burst into song, just one cornetto, which was the famous advert that made cornetto, you know, kind of brand leader. It's pretty much the only ad. It was the first one, and it's the only one that people remember. And there are many brands, once you start to think about it, that actually they're there and they're famous because they did something famous right at the beginning that wasn't very System 2. The thing about System 2 is once we are moved emotionally, System 1, we will fill in the gaps. We will, we will find out what we need to find out. We will find any post-rationalization, but that's the way it works. Emotion rules even with new brands. Great stuff. There's, uh, we, we got through almost three webinars without John singing, <laughs> <laughs> but it couldn't last. Here's, here's another good question. In my work, I feel another missing piece is personality, including cultural proclivities. What's your thoughts on that? So what do we, what do we think about culture and system one and system two? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I mean, I, so it's always best to reveal prejudices, you know, because that's a frame uh, in its own right, and we, you know, we look for confirmation bias, you know, of course. But my, the thing I like most is things that are universal. Now, that doesn't mean that culture and countries and the frame in which you live, the social framework in which you live and the culture doesn't have an impact. It has a massive impact. What colors mean can affect. I mean, the lovely one I heard, I, this is such a silly example, but it's apparently real is sleeping pills around the world, the most effective color for a sleeping pill, and it makes a big difference, by the way, is blue. Blue helps you believe that this is going to work. Apart from one country, <laughs> Italy, I, I don't know, I've got a thing about Italy tonight, so, you know, because blue is the national color of the football team. And therefore, blue is exciting, not sleepy. You know? and, and so, yes, culture. And the frame in which you live, I think, has a huge impact on both the social dimension, what other people do, and therefore what you copy, and the environmental um, side of things. I think it has less to do with the personal. You know, the last one that we were talking about, I think that is more universal, is my opinion. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. We got, um, in, in labs, actually, we got asked a question the other day, uh, are Germans more rational? Uh, we had a we had a client who wanted to know whether this was true. The stereotype of the Germans is that they're more rational, and we looked into it, and we we, we realised that essentially no, because what you see is you see that maybe there's a kind of impulse. Um, they might impulsively look for safety, where other other cultures might impulsively take more risks. But in both cases, it's a system one impulse. It's not a rational thought through impulse. It's it's the impulsive gut reaction that's driving things. So and system one still. And the extension of that, because I know it's come up as questions in the past, so let, let's just cover it, is do people make different decisions by category? Are there some categories that are more rational, more system two? And if you take the extreme, business to business or industrial sort of categories? No, the human brain works in the same way, whether it's a doctor choosing drugs or whether it's us choosing which beer to have at the bar or you know, a perfume to buy. The thing that is different is the need for post-rationalization. The degree to which you have to justify your decision is, I think, the thing that changes in the main. The way we make it is still instinctive, intuitive, and copying, and all the things that we've talked about. Absolutely. Here's, <clears throat> here's another one. Um, which emotions, this is, this is a very quick one, uh, which emotions are most critical? Okay. The only answer I can give you with, with, in, to match the precision, if you like, that I suspect behind the question is in the correlations that we have studied of what emotions seem to drive success in advertising, happiness, and then there is a scale even within happiness from the religious ecstatic type feeling through to pride at the, at the weaker end and surprise, then the negative emotions and then neutral. And the only other thing I would say about this is in relation to virality, in relation to what is going to spread, you know, which has become a big thing on the internet. And it seems that the magic ingredient in things spreading is not just how emotionally resonant it is, that matters, but it's surprise. Stuff that goes viral is always really surprising. It has some element of surprise that you want to pass on and you know, have friends and colleagues have the same sort of reaction that you had. 
One more, Tom, or any challenges? Just to finish. I think oh, we've got a we've got a we've got a couple. One one bit of uh, housekeeping that um, we have someone who I've, I've replied privately, but they missed uh, the name of the author who wrote about System One and System Two. So um, it's Daniel Kahneman, K A H N E M A N, and it's Thinking Fast and Slow. It's the, we'll the must-read we'll, book. Yeah, we'll send it out in the in the follow-up email, so you'll have some detail. Yeah, absolutely. And then um, right here's a. Where's, where's one we haven't asked? Sorry, I've been I've been cherry picking them too much. <laughs> uh, well, here's here's a here's a here's a, a there's actually a little question here about um, about social call, which I think was the thing I talked about. For your social call, how do you translate what people say their neighbours would do into learning? Is it a literal translation? Um, for example, if they say my neighbour would be offended by that ad, then the conclusion is that the ad is offensive. Well, the very quick answer to that is that as with any call. Um, the kind of initial response is the first response, and then you probe and moderate, and so you actually combine that kind of breadth with the kind of in depth. You, you then say, well, what do you think about it, and try to get those kind of layers. Um, so we wouldn't be as literal as that. And here's another one. Here is this is this is we got this question before as well, and it's a uh, it's it's one that I I like hearing John answer. Um, how does BrainJuice apply this philosophy to their own marketing? This presentation seems quite system two. <laughs> very nice, very nice, very nice. I like it. I like it. I like it. Well, partly <laughs> when I do it live, one answer is we abandon PowerPoint because actually the engagement of a live presenter to is similar content, but actually it's much more. It becomes much more system one and getting the audience to to do little exercises to demonstrate the different kind of truths is a much better way, I agree, than bar charts and evidence. Because we've had the evidence about how advertising works best for many years. And I think it has been in existence for many years. In fact, behavioral economics has been around since the 70s. And it's only now really taking off. And the reason is because system two evidence isn't what persuades people. What you have to do is move. You have to actually make it exciting. You have to make it feel. You have to feel something, even if it's negative. You know that's better than neutral. Um, so we're learning. We're learning. We're trying to apply this stuff to ourselves. I'll give you one final thing, which I know everyone will shoot me for for saying, but we have been experimenting. We used to do a bit like Procter and Gamble. Everyday low pricing, we would do one simple price on our proposals because I was always, you know, kind of irritated by lots of different, you know, kind of witterings on pricing. Anyway, we've now been experimenting with three levels of pricing as standard, a bit like the wine menu with the, you know, low cost, middle cost, and a really, you know, kind of super juicy, which of course would be brilliant, but no one buys it or we don't expect anyone to really buy it, but it suddenly makes the middle one seem really reasonable. <laughs> and of course, I've now given you the secret sauce so that you can be immune to this technique. So <laughs> feel free. Um, but uh, do you know what? It, it does work. It does work. And um, anyway, I, I hope being transparent about it is, is the best policy. <laughs> Tom, okay. should, we, should, we, should we call it quits? I think I think we can wrap up there. We've 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 almost gone on an hour. Um, thanks right. so much for everyone for for attending and listening. Thank you enormously, John, for for the presentation. Oh, um, thanks. And thanks for all the great questions and comments. All right, everyone. See you next and, time. Yeah. Cheerio. <laughs>